Now, hear this. As the President of the United States approaches to board a naval vessel, the traditional call is United States arriving. Since the year of its birth in 1775, the United States Navy has grown to greatness through constant change and the guiding hand of tradition. Ships of the line have made the transition from sail to steam, from coal and diesel power to modern nuclear propulsion. Masts that once were rigged with canvas sails now support an abstract jungle of equipment for guidance, control, warning, and communications. The primitive cannons of revolutionary days have evolved into weapons more powerful, more complex, more effective. Some weapons that played a vital role in the earlier history of the United States are still important as part of the Navy's traditional ceremonies. Some have given way to guided missiles that seek and find an unseen target over the far rim of the horizon. Early attempts at submarine craft have gradually become long-range submersibles with startling capabilities. While powered kites of wood and wire that challenge the alien air now ride on a crest of thunder across the restless sea. But with all the seeming change that has marked the progress of the United States Navy through the years, still there remains the constant factor of the men who have made the progress possible. The men of the Navy and the Marine Corps, whose loyalty and devotion to duty, to the nation, and to high personal and professional principles have brought American sea power to world leadership. Not only is continuity of pride and purpose found in the caliber and discipline of men of the Naval Service, but also in the customs and traditions that have delineated patterns of conduct across the years. And among the great traditions is the historic relationship of the Navy with its Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. In return, the Presidents have responded to this loyalty in these words. It follows then as certain as that night succeeds day, that without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. The events of the war give an increased interest and importance to the Navy, which will probably extend beyond the war itself, and to maintain our respectful position on the ocean. An adequate and highly trained Navy is the best guarantee against war, the cheapest and most effective peace insurance. The cost of building and maintaining such a Navy represents the very latest premium for ensuring peace, which this nation can possibly pay. And what is there behind the President of the United States? Well, in the first place, there is a Navy, which for my part, I am very proud of. A Navy which for its members, ship by ship, man by man, officer by officer, I believe to be the equal of any Navy in the world. Officers and men of the Naval Service have carried on splendidly in fair weather and foul their devotion to duty, their spirited endeavor to keep the Navy strong is an inspiration to those who would hold this country's welfare above self. Part of the Naval tradition in the relationship with the Commander-in-Chief is the review of the fleet, a demonstration of the readiness of men and equipment whose combined efficiency is the basic strength of the nation's sea power. So it was that the announced visit of President John F. Kennedy to the first fleet off the west coast in early June of 1963 set off a chain reaction of preparation. No man in the fleet was immune to the significance of the occasion. Shoes took on a brighter shine that sparkled like moonlight on a tropic sea. Personal gear was sorted, mended, cleaned, and pressed. Out of lockers and sea chests came swords to be polished and hefted and handled, not to repel boarders, but to welcome them. At the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, where the President was scheduled to stop on his way to the fleet, the word was passed and was quickly translated into action. 
more than 200 miles to the north, on the edge of the desert, was the terminal point for the president's trip, China Lake. Here the personnel of Knott's, the Naval Ordnance Test Station, made ready to display and demonstrate some of the newest weapons and facilities to support the Navy's sea power program. At the same time, on all the ships at sea, the classic chores of the ocean-going Navy received extra special attention. Where rust appeared, or paint had worn thin, experienced artisans of the chipping tool and paintbrush applied their skills with satisfying results. Decks became immaculate. Under the application of brush, buffing cloth, and elbow grease, the bright work glittered like mint gold. The multicolored laundry of the signal bridge was washed by hand and hung in the breeze to dry. From keel to the tip of the mainmast, every ship received the traditional extra polish in preparation for the president's approaching visit. Helicopters to be featured in anti-submarine warfare demonstrations were inspected and run through. <laughs> Aboard the carriers, the planes to be flown in the fleet review were subject to a complete checkout. Special care was given to the arresting gear. Four cables, thick as a man's wrist, stretched taut across the carrier's deck and connected with an arresting engine below decks. Each cable is designed to catch and hold over 20 tons at more than 100 miles per hour. To keep the ships in the operating area during rehearsals, Refueling was carried out at sea, as it is done in actual fleet operations. And when the skipper says, fill her up, the exchange can take several hours, and plenty of heads-up seamanship. First stop on the tour was the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. On the morning of 6 June, President John F. Kennedy arrived with Secretary of the Navy, Fred Korth, to be greeted by the commanding general and by Senator Engel of California. With the arrival of the president, the traditional salute of 21 guns roared in welcome. As the sound of the last shot faded, the president inspected the ranks of men drawn up in formation. Then the Commander-in-Chief toured the base. Starting where new Marine recruits receive their first warm welcome from the drill instructors who guide their footsteps in the days of training. The transition from civilian to a full-fledged Marine is not accomplished overnight. But many of the primary steps are managed with a minimum waste of time. For example, the three-minute haircut which caught the President's eye. A visit to the barber shop showed how efficiently this job can be done. When it's completed, a man doesn't worry about where to part his hair. Next was a stop for a look at the living quarters. Long before the Marines explored the halls of Montezuma and stormed ashore at Tripoli, they had a tradition of physical fitness. They had to be tough in those days. They still are. Then the inspection was over, and the presidential party was boarding helicopters to fly out to the fleet operating at sea beyond the Coronado Islands. As they headed west, they circled the San Diego Harbor, into which the Spanish explorer Juan Cabrillo had first sailed in his small caravel in 1542. Then down along the Silver Strand, where amphibious craft were moving into position for their part in the fleet review. Soon the helicopters were approaching Task Force 10 of the First Fleet. 18 ships, 15,000 men. Many of the ships bore names of men and battles and events that have set standards of courage or achievement in our nation's history. Here is the third Columbus in naval history. 
a guided missile cruiser. The first Columbus was a 28-gun brig in the Continental Navy, Washington's Navy. The fifth Preble, a guided missile frigate, perpetuating the name of Commodore Edward Preble, one of the founders of naval traditions. The first Preble was an 80-ton sloop that took part in the War of 1812. Hornet, anti-submarine warfare support carrier, the eighth ship to bear this famous name. The earliest Hornet fought gallantly in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812 under the command of James Lawrence, who lives forever in naval tradition through his dying words, don't give up the ship. Now another page was about to be written in the record of naval traditions. As the president's helicopter approached the carrier Ariscany, there rose the historical call that denotes the approach of the president. United States arriving. As the helicopter touched down on the deck, the president's flag was broken at the main. It would be kept flying as long as he remained aboard. And the pipes, which once were worn by the Lord High Admiral of the British fleet, piped the president aboard. Now from the guns of all the ships in the task force came the thunder of the 21-gun salute. In some time long past, it was decided that odd numbers were luckier than even numbers. So the president's salute has always been 21 guns. Early gunners used to transfer 21 beans from one hand to the other to keep track of the count. And the rhythm of the firing was determined by a line that the gun captain repeated to himself. If I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Fire, number one. If I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Fire, number two. Today, the cadence is the same. But a modern stopwatch calls the tune. In a high-flying version of the traditional salute, carrier planes explode across the sky with a spangle of 21 aerial bursts. honors had been completed, President Kennedy addressed the men of the Oriskany, then inspected the Navy's latest command and control system installed in the 44,000-ton attack carrier. From the flight deck of Oriskany, the presidential party took off for the carrier Kitty Hawk, named for the historic North Carolina site where the Wright brothers in 1903 proved that man need not forever be anchored to the ground upon which he walked. Kitty Hawk is the world's first guided missile attack aircraft carrier. 80,000 tons, more than 1,000 feet in length, with a flight deck covering approximately four acres. Yet she moves through the water at a speed of more than 30 knots. United States arriving. party were Secretary of the Navy Fred Corth, Governor Brown of California, and Senator Claire Engel. Also participating were Admiral John H. Sides, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, and Vice Admiral R.T.S. Keith, 
Commander First Fleet. With the distinguished guests in a good position to see the scheduled events, the fleet exercises began. First, some of the aircraft and weapons to be demonstrated were put on display. The F-8D Crusader, an all-weather supersonic fighter, armed with an air-to-air -air heat-seeking missile, the Sidewinder. The F-4B Phantom II, the Navy's newest, the world's fastest all-weather fighter interceptor. Here it is being armed with Sparrow III missiles. The Navy's largest and smallest jets, the RA-52 Vigilante and the Q-2C Fire Bee target drone. The Vigilante is a Mach II long-range all-weather tactical reconnaissance plane and attack bomber. The Fire Bee is a high-speed remote-controlled jet drone, a fast-moving training target. The first event, a high-speed flyby of four vigilantes across the bow of Kitty Hawk. As they zipped across the sky at supersonic speeds, the air turbulence of the sonic barrier tumbled in visible curving lines against the plane surfaces. And as the vigilantes raced past the fleet, the air was shattered in a giant whiplash of sound. With the release of a Fire Bee drone, a quartet of Crusader jets flashed across the sky in hot pursuit and fired their Sidewinder missiles. As the drone tumbled seawards, off the starboard beam, a cluster of flares appeared in the sky. These presented a very small heat target for the Sidewinder rockets. But one after another, the target showed the effects of the Sidewinder's accuracy. Next, another supersonic drone streaked toward the fleet as the Phantom fighters closed on the target at speeds of more than 1,000 miles an hour. Ahead of Kitty Hawk, the guided missile frigates and destroyers swung into position for surface-to-air firings of the Terrier and the Tartar missiles. For the purpose of the demonstration, ships of the task force that are normally deployed over hundreds of square miles were brought together in a tight formation. Ten miles away from Kitty Hawk, a drone came in for the attack. Now the fleet exercises moved into the anti-submarine warfare demonstration. Just off Kitty Hawk's beam, the submarine permit showed her sail in a power brooch. She then submerged to serve as a target for the rest of the team. The P-3A Orion, with its high-powered electronic, sonic, and magnetic systems, quickly picked up the track of the deep-diving submarine. Smoke lights were used to pinpoint where the submarine was last detected and the Orion pulled out to leave the field to the other members of the ASW team. Following the Orion's lead, out from the carriers came two tracker planes and two Sea King jet-powered turbocopters. The trackers dropped more smoke lights as they picked up contacts with the magnetic detection equipment housed in the stinger that projects from the plane's tail. The smoke flares define the path and indicate the speed of a submarine. The helicopters hovering over the markers lowered transducers into the water to make a sonar contact. The fixed wing aircraft maneuvered into attack position. The pilot received the latest sonar fix from the helicopters and a depth charge was on its way to the target. As the aircraft cleared the area, they passed their most recent information of the submarine's position to the destroyers making a high-speed approach. From the deck of the destroyer Larsen, a small remote-controlled helicopter known as Dash 
demonstrated another means of attack on enemy submarines. Carrying either depth charges or torpedoes, it can be directed to the point of the last contact. After it drops its charge, it can be brought back to the ship again. Aboard the destroyers Osborne and Keyes, the missile launchers swung into position. This is ASROC, anti-submarine rocket. A thousand pound missile, a depth charge, or an acoustic homing torpedo on target. The final part of the fleet exercises in honor of President Kennedy took place on the flight deck of Kitty Hawk. Planes of the carrier's fighter and reconnaissance squadrons were hurled into the air by catapults or raced along the deck to become airborne. The President saw much of the flight deck action from the ship's bridge, where he could observe the landings and takeoffs through the bridge windows, or watch it on television over the ship's closed circuit. the last plane aboard, the president was introduced to the crew by the commander, Carrier Division One. Officers and men of Task Force 10, the President of the United States. Admiral, gentlemen, on behalf of all of us who visited with you today to express our warm appreciation, I think all of us have been impressed by how vigorously and successfully the United States Navy has applied all of the modern advances in science and technology to this age-old struggle of maintenance of control of the seas. Just as Admiral Mann said uh, more than 50 years ago, any country which wishes to protect its security and the security of those allied with it must maintain its position on the sea. And if there is any lesson of the 20th century, and especially of the past few years, it is that in spite of the advances in space and in the air, in strategic air, this country must still move easily and safely across the seas of the world. The events of October 1962 indicated, as they had all through history, that control of the sea means security. Control of the seas can mean peace. Control of the seas can mean victory. The United States must control the seas if it is to protect our security and those countries which stretch thousands of miles away but look to you and this ship and the sister ship of the United States Navy. I want to express our appreciation to all of you. The sea is a friend and an enemy. Those of you who sail it know it. Those of you who sail it carry with you our warmest appreciation and our best hopes for the future. Thank you, gentlemen. At the conclusion of the remarks, carrier planes overflying the fleet responded with a rapid fire salute against the background of the sky. And aboard Kitty Hawk, President Kennedy followed the traditional custom of extending personal greetings to the officers and men assembled on the flight deck. In mid-morning the following day, the president took his leave. From Kitty Hawk, he would go to Point Magoo, the Navy's Pacific Missile Range, then on to the Naval Ordnance Test Station at China Lake.
The arrival was well covered with binocular concentration. And by young Americans in very undress whites. The test range. A wide stretch of open desert confined in a corral of encircling mountains provides a practical proving ground for the weapons of today and the concepts of tomorrow. Here the president, with the commander of the test station, observed a demonstration of some of the Navy's aircraft and weapons. When the traditional visit was over, the president, like other presidents before him, had reviewed the fleet, the weapons, and the men. He had said, the control of the sea means security. Control of the seas can mean peace. History has proved this true in years past, with dedicated Navy men and Marines in fighting ships. The wooden, wind-driven ships are now great carriers of steel. Greyhounds of the sea. Missile launching frigates. A highly mobile Marine Corps that can land its men wherever they are needed at a moment's notice. Nuclear powered submarines that prowl the cold deep waters of the Earth's oceans on constant patrol. A powerful Navy Marine Corps team. A self-sustaining mobile force constantly moving across the waters of the four oceans of the world. Alert and equipped to meet any threat of aggression anywhere, at any time. And yet, on every ship of the United States Navy, there also rides the accumulated heritage of such men as John Paul Jones, Lawrence, Preble, Perry, Farragut, and Decatur. For the traditions of the Navy and the Marine Corps will always be reflected in the discipline, the devotion, and the loyalty of the men who follow the sea, and whose skills and dedication are bulwarks of the far-ranging sea power of the United States of America. <laughs>